Okay, we're going to kind of move right into the uh, Elk Creek Fire Protection District. And um, I got a call on this uh, just, just here about a month ago, and um, we uh, have kind of been trying to put together some speakers on it. And so what we have tonight is um, Tom Carby is going to come up here in just a couple of minutes, and he's going to, he is a, um, an insurance agent with um, uh, Farmers, <laughs> Um, and uh, Farmers Insurance, and he's going to come up and talk to us a little bit about some of the, the insurance impact, the impact on insurance related to some of the fire rating systems and things like that. And then um, we will have somebody also talking from the fire department. Um, but uh, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of go there in just a second. Um, Tom, if you could come on up. And um, basically, Tom's just going to kind of give us kind of a, an overview of some of the insurance issues. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me just fine. I don't know if I even need that. Um, Tom Carby, I've been a farmer's insurance agent for 18 years in downtown Evergreen, and um, I, I love being in the insurance business. It changes daily. And uh, this summer and last summer, we've seen some dramatic changes. And, and so they asked me to come up and just talk about that a little bit. Insurance companies have, have changed what they do um, on, on a on a day to day basis, uh, on how they they look at homes in businesses in a particular area, um, they have as I as I try to describe it to people. Uh, when I first started, um, each one of us were were in a piece of pie, and and there were like four slices of pie, and we'd all fit in one of those pieces. Today, there's a million slices of pie, and we each fit in one of those. So. Uh, it, everyone has, it, has uh, or most insurance companies have developed um, such unique and, and very defined ways to, to look at homes and in, in the mountain communities. Um, and so what they wanted me to talk about a little bit about is, is the two, two main ways that they, they look at homes today. And that's one is fire protection class. Uh, which the fire department will probably talk a little bit about as well. But fire protection class basically is is how well the fire department is able to respond to your home in, in a fire incident. How, what kind of, of trucks, equipment, men, water can they bring to a scene in, in a certain period of time. And so obviously if your home is is 10 miles from the fire station, their ability to respond to that fire um, is, is going to be much tougher than if you're right next door to the fire station. And so um, as fire, uh, fire departments expand and add more stations, your fire protection class um, can go down. Currently, most of the mountain area is, is in a protection class five or six. There are, there are numerous areas and, and homes that are located in very outlying, outlying areas that are in a fire protection class of nine. Let me tell you how this relates to insurance. If you're in a fire protection class five, you're gonna see a, a fairly competitive rate uh, insurance rate, but if your fire protection class is, is a nine, you're going to see premiums that are double that, and very possibly you could be looking at at working with insurance companies, uh, what we call high risk insurance companies that that have a, a very expensive premium. The the policy isn't nearly as as effective and or good. Higher deductibles. A lot of factors may come into play when it comes to your fire protection. Um, particular classification. So uh, that's how fire protection class works. The, the other part of, of, uh, of what insurance companies doing today is what's called an, uh, a fire line score. ISO has developed this fire line score and they use, they use some very high tech uh, satellite imagery to determine what the brush load is in an area. So there's three main factors. Brush load, so that's the amount of trees, the, um, the, whether they be scrub oak or you know, tall pines. Um, and so uh, the amount of brush and, and, and trees and vegetation in an area that is close to your home. So that's one factor. The other factor is where is your home located at. So if it's on a dead end street versus being uh, right next to the highway, um, obviously, a dead end street, the fire department isn't going to want to try to defend that home nearly as well as they are one that's close to the highway. Uh, the, other, the other factor is slope. 
So if your, your home is sitting on the side of a cliff versus on a flat piece of property in, in the middle of a valley, um, so uh, obviously it's a lot easier to defend the home down in the valley. So the three factors of, an, of a fire line score being slope, brush load, and location. So what insurance companies done over the last couple of years is they've taken this information and they've been able to develop insurance rates based on that and, and um, they've been able to determine whether or not they even want to insure a home. Uh, you may be in a fire protection class five, but your, your fire line score is extremely high. And if your fire line score is really high, an insurance company looks at that and says, we don't care what your fire protection class is, we care what your fire line score is, and we don't want to insure you because you, there's too much brush in your area. So every insurance company is, is developing ways and to, to determine whether or not they feel like you're a safe risk. And that's why there's so many things that the fire department can talk to you about, fire mitigation, um, uh, in your area, uh, working with the fire department to uh, come up with um, better fire protection classes and um, the building codes, keeping your house up to code. What most people don't realize is if you build a new home, the fire department comes out, takes a look at it and says, okay, you're, 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 you're up to code here. And then 10 years later, you let that house, just trees grow up everywhere. Well, you're, you're supposed to keep that home in, within code and most people don't do that. They'll let trees grow up or they'll plant trees and, and so it, it changes um, the, you know, whether or not your home is insurable when you allow a lot of trees grow up next to your house. So hopefully that was helpful. I know he didn't give me much time so I tried to cram a lot in there. So uh, if there's any questions on any of that, I'll be glad to field them. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm going to hang around. So. Questions on the ratings? Or yep. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, right now there are no homes that are uninsurable because we have these high-risk insurance companies that I can write that will insure a shack. And why, I don't know, but they will. Uh, but when you talk about your farmers, state farms, American Family, Allstate, your, your, big, your big insurance companies that everybody knows the name of, when you're talking about those companies, they are, are you know, creating tougher and tougher standards for you to be able to get insurance. And are there homes that can't get insurance? With those main companies, yes, you might build yourself a million dollar home and um, have, have a very tough time getting a, a, a good rate, a, a competitive rate. Does that help? Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Tom. I forgot, uh, <laughs> Rob reminded me that he found an extra mic for us so that we can do uh, questions from the audience. So I'll, I'll try and do that as we move forward here. So the, uh, um, the next speaker was supposed to be Fire Chief McLaughlin, um, but uh, would you like a promotion today? <laughs> I've, got, I've got Chief McLaughlin's bio here, but I won't take the time to read it. I'll just let you introduce yourself if that's okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Davis. I'm a volunteer firefighter with Elk Creek. I uh, need to extend an apology to you. Uh, Chief McLaughlin was planning on being here to speak to the group. Uh, he had something come up and he's unable to attend. Um, imagine coming to a tea party meeting uh, to talk about a tax increase. Probably a pretty, pretty crazy idea. But please try to keep in mind that we're not talking federal tax or state tax. This is your local fire department, uh, which in my mind, uh, there's a bit of a difference. <clears throat> the reason I'm here to speak to you this evening is to uh, inform you, uh, try to let you know that the Elk Creek Fire Protection District will be seeking a mill levy increase of 2.5 mills on the November ballot. Um, <clears throat> The primary funding source for the Elk Creek Fire Protection District is from mill levy uh, taxes on real estate. Uh, we also get income from ambulance charges and reimbursements for trucks and personnel that we provide to fight large forest fires uh, out of the district. 
Uh, we also aggressively pursue grants, although grants uh, are getting harder to come by uh, and uh, they turn out to be a pretty small part of our budget. <clears throat> the Elk Creek Fire Protection District uh, in 2011-2012 cut its operating budget by 24% or $240,197. Uh, in 2013, the Oak Creek Fire Protection District cut their operating budget by an additional $242,005. Uh, this was achieved through the elimination of one uh, half-time administrative assistant, uh, one full-time fire marshal, one full-time assistant chief and training officer by reducing the uh, benefits that were available to the, to the paid staff the elimination of the apparatus uh, replacement funding and uh, delaying facility, ma uh, facility maintenance and also putting off the purchase of fire equipment, namely uh, bunker gear and that sort of thing. Uh, for 2014, we've received a notice that uh, property valuations uh, in our district are going to be reduced another 3.75 to 6%. Uh, we anticipate that this will reduce our revenues by forty to sixty-five thousand dollars. <throat> okay, in two thousand and six and two thousand and ten, we went to the voters and asked for funds to replace some aging fire trucks. Uh, we didn't; uh, those those requests for funding were unsuccessful. We've still got those trucks; they're now twenty-five years old. The pumps on the trucks are failing their test. Uh, the trucks can only manage about 10 miles an hour when going uphill, and all three of them leak uh, pretty badly. They're, they're nice old trucks, but they're getting, uh, they're getting up there. Now the fire district is in a position where uh, we could end up losing our tanker credit. Uh, a tanker credit, since in Conifer, since we don't have a municipal water system for the entire community. We have a few subdivisions that actually have hydrants. Uh, the, the majority of us depend on the tankers to bring water. Uh, and we have a tanker credit rating that the ISO insurance companies recognize. And so instead of saying that your house has to be within a thousand feet of a pressurized hydrant, they give you credit because the fire department can deliver a tanker with water to your residence to fight your fire. However, the 2012 ISO uh, standards have been updated and they're more difficult to comply with. The next time we get an ISO inspection, we don't believe that our two tankers and our engine are going to pass. If they don't pass, that would mean a downgrade of the fire protection rating for the entire community. Uh, two, three, four, five. I think I'm going through this too fast. All right, the Elk Creek Fire Protection uh, District has the lowest levy rate of any fire protection district in Jefferson or Park County at 4.915 mils. Uh, it is among the lowest in the state of Colorado. The owner of a $336,000 house, which I believe that number was picked because that's an average, uh, is presently assessed $131.45 a year uh, for Jeffco taxes that uh, are in turn paid to the Elk Creek Fire Protection District. If the proposed 2.5% mill levy increase was voted in, the same, owner, same homeowner would be assessed a total of $198.31 annually, uh, an additional $5.57 a month. Uh, I'm not an insurance expert, so I can't speak to it, but I've been told by the professionals that if we lost our tanker rating, that homeowners insurance could go up between 20 and 50 percent depending on where you are. Um, <clears throat> da, 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 da. Uh, as, re as a result of the equipment reductions, it's estimated that blah, 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 fires insurance yeah, would increase. As a result of the equipment reductions, it's estimated that the same home, same homeowner, the $336,000 house, his fire insurance rate would increase $236 a year. Uh, in, some, in some cases, fire insurance policies will be canceled. In other cases, companies will not issue new policies in the district. I think we're already starting to see that. And that's basically all I've got. I can open it up for questions. If we have any questions, I'll 
pass the mic here. Hi, thanks for coming, Mike. My name is Bruce Ward, and I live at, uh, in Pine Junction. And before that, I lived in Berlin, and I've been evacuated from my home three times. And I want to commend you and all of the fire department members for what you do. You put your lives on the line. And it seems to me that this is a no-brainer. There's no question in my mind that we shouldn't be supporting this mill levy, but perhaps even a larger mill levy. What I understood is that it, in a best-case scenario, you can only really handle one fire at a time, given the equipment that you have in your radius. And that seems to me, in this, in this particular time, when every day, every night, we're reading about fires, we're seeing the fires on the TV, it's all around us, and you know, I would um, do anything I can to help support you guys in, in making this melody happen because I love living up here and I want our family to be safe. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, sir. Question is, what can we do to help? Well, I guess the, uh, the thing you can do to help is talk to your friends and your neighbors and, and make them aware of the situation. Have them do their due diligence and try to investigate the situation, make sure that they understand it. And, and I'm kind of with you. I think if you understand it, it's a, it's a pretty cut and dried issue. Well, I commend you for coming here and trying to sell a tax increase at Tea Party. But, uh, Thank you. And maybe I can put some questions <laughs> in your mind. Uh, my name is Mike Bartlett. I uh, served 10 years as a volunteer with Elk Creek, two years as a, a training officer as a volunteer. I was seven years an officer with Elk Creek. Uh, I was let go in 2012 for my political views. Uh, I was also the uh, treasurer of the district for four years, so I, I'm pretty familiar with uh, with the uh, finances of the district. I've been trying to get some detailed financial reports uh, from the district, and I haven't had much luck. I did, uh, through a friend, I got a um, copy of the uh, latest uh, assessment, and the assessor says, or the the assessment says that the uh, district overspent their budget by more than $260,000 in 2012, not uh, saved us $250,000 in the state. And if the budget was cut by a half a million dollars in the last two years, the budget should be coming in around a million dollars, which is just about what our uh, tax assessment is. And I, I, I just don't believe some of the figures that I'm hearing from uh, Friends of Elk Creek. And I'd really like to see some, some uh, honest, detailed financial statements. Uh, do you think the district is willing to provide information like that to uh, the district? <clears throat> well, I'm a volunteer firefighter for the district. Um, I don't have any authority to, uh, in that regard. I think that the... For, for myself, when the, when the chief provides these numbers to the, uh, to the board, uh, they review them with their accountants and attorneys and everybody else, and they give them to me, for me, I believe them. I think, I think that they're honest. Uh, and that's not coming from any professional position as an accountant or auditor or anything else. I'm a firefighter and I have faith in my department and I don't think that they're lying to anybody. And I've seen what's going on in the department. You know, for instance, right now, we no longer have coffee. If you want a cup of coffee at our fire department, you have to bring your own coffee. We don't have bottled water uh, because we can't afford it. Uh, the paid st the staff that shifts overnight, they no longer get cable TV because we can't afford it. Uh, they've told the staff, if you want to watch television, then you need to start up a kitty and pay for your own TV. So it's, it's down to cutting those tiny little things. And again, you know, I'm, I'm just a rookie firefighter. I don't have access to the inner workings of the organization, but I, uh, when they tell me these things, I, I believe them. And uh, I don't know. That's, I, I don't know how else I would advise you to contact Chief McLaughlin. I'm sorry he's not here to address your questions personally. Uh, but that would be uh, my best advice to you would be go directly to him and, and ask him. And I'm sure he'll, he'll tell you whatever you need to know. Anything else? Yeah, I have a quick question for you. You talked about your tankers and being in old and in bad condition. Um, one, I'd, I'd like to know, 
um, a little bit about that and, and if you feel like you, you can reduce the tankers uh, you know, down to two, uh, you said you had three, I believe? Uh, we have, currently we have one fire engine and two tankers that are over 25 years old. Okay. And out of that equipment, do you think you could re replace uh, three with two if you had modern equipment? And I, I think my understanding, and again I apologize, they sent you the wrong guy to answer good questions. My understanding is that we need to have one operable tanker at each of the four stations. So we need four tankers that will pass the pump test, uh, and it would be nice if they could actually get up the hill. Because uh, currently, uh, our old tanker takes, our old tanker fully loaded from station one will do about seven miles an hour up Conifer Mountain. And if I lived on top of Conifer Mountain and I called the fire department, I would hope that they would be rushing to my home a little faster than seven miles an hour. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't you know, know if, if I answered your question. Out of this go ahead. Please, it go does ahead. say by making some changes in the fleet, the district can reduce the number of vehicles, the annual replacement cost, insurance, and maintenance. They can go, the revised fleet would be 17 instead of 25 and would have a total estimated replacement cost of $3,900,000. Nine. They do say that lifespan on some of these vehicles are 6 to 20 years, our 20, ours are 25. So I guess it's even cost prohibitive to repair at this point. And I encourage you guys before you leave, this is an excellent piece of information. It's got dollar values broken down, repair costs. It's an excellent thing for you to make an educated decision. We'll have them at the table. I encourage you to grab them on your way out, but it does reference that. It does Absolutely. look like we can go down. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Okay, follow-up question. Do you know when the last ISO review was of Elk Creek, and do you know when the next one is coming out? No, I don't know when the last one was. Uh, I've been told that we could expect one in the next year or two. Uh, the reason for the urgency as far as trying to make these changes and update this equipment is that it takes up to a year to put a, a new tender in service. Uh, you know, you don't, it's not like going to buy a car off the, the, the lot, you don't just go pick out the color you want or whatever. You actually start with the chassis and they build the, uh, build the apparatus for you. Then you have to pick it up, have it tested, certified, blah, blah, blah. Our last one, uh, 461, we have one beautiful tender that carries 3,000 3, gallons. Uh, it took us almost a year to get it into service from the date it was ordered. We don't, we don't want to wait until we have the ISO test and they say these don't pass and, and then it's kind of going to be too late. We're going to do uh, two more quick questions here and uh, just in the interest of time we need to kind of move, move this on. Um, hi, I'm Melody Messmer. I'm probably one of the newest residents up here. I've been a homeowner up here about three weeks. Um, had no problems getting insurance. They didn't even look at my ISO rating. They did look at the Fireline um, stuff, looked at the satellite picture and said you're good to go. Um, I also am a previous Elk Creek Fire Department member. I was a paid member for five years and a volunteer for seven years. I was also primarily responsible for all of their grant writing, which leads me to one of my questions. You said that they are actively grant writing. Between 2001 and 2011, Elk Creek received over a million dollars in grant money, but outside funding is zeroed out on the current budget. Um, area surrounding departments are, are actively fundraising, not only through grants, but actively fundraising to fill their budget gaps and are receiving funds well into from $80,000 to $300,000 at some of our smaller departments. What is Elk Creek doing to raise funds outside of dipping into my pocket? Uh, as I say, Elk Creek is, is aggressively trying to find grants. We did find a, a grant recently for, I believe, around $80,000 for training. Um, one of the problems that we ran into is, is that uh, some of the previous grant administration, we ended up having to pay back $20,000 because the grants that we got in the past were mismanaged. Uh, and we had to give that money back, and that wasn't in the budget, and that kind of hurt us a little bit. Uh, but yeah, we are trying to get grants. Um, you know, an $80,000 grant is amazing. It's going to help us with our training, and we're very delighted to have it. But I think when you look at an overall budget of, of uh, you know, a million plus, $80,000, you know, to me it's a lot of money to a million plus uh, dollar organization. It's a small part of the, of the budget. Does, it, it's, does that answer your question? Pardon me? No. 
No? Okay. Can, if you got a follow-up question, or can I be any more clear? Is that one grant the only outside fundraising effort that you're seeking, or are there other... No, we've done uh, outside fundraising. We had a car, the rookies had a car wash, which was very successful. They raised uh, $2,500 in a day. Uh, we received donations from the public. Uh, we everybody's been really supportive, you know, with all the fires and, and uh, really happy with our performance and, and how we've been able to handle, you know, things the best we could. So we've received a fair amount of money and donations. We have uh, done other fundraising efforts, but again, you can't run you can't run a fire department on bank sales. I mean, I think they're great, but it's. And I, I don't know of any department in the area. Uh, you know, you guys all talk about how we should all, you know, just maybe be volunteers and be like Inner Canyon or, or North Fork and, and hallelujah, let's uh, give us their mill rate and uh, we'll go for it. Um, I've, we've, got, uh, we're, we've got an answer here on the ISO question and oh, then also go. we're going to have time for one more question after this. Tommy, uh, ISO is due next year. And to answer the fundraising question, I've been um, videotaping and attending the Elk Creek meetings for over a year now, and you can find all those videos on my website, mymountaintown.com. The links are on the paper. Um, they do talk about grant writing for grants and looking for fundraising, and they have been doing that over the past. They've won a couple, they've lost several. So they are actively trying it, but they are also, because they've had to reduce staff, they don't have the manpower right now to write a lot of them. And keep in mind that some of these grants they're going for are federal monies. So again, that's still your tax dollars, but that's also everyone else's tax dollars, not us funding our own local department. And that's just my personal opinion on that one, but um, that's still money coming out of your pocket in some way, shape, or form. Any other uh, questions? We have time for one more. Yep. Back over here. I just wanted to address the, um, the comment about giving you North Fork or, or Inner Canyons Mill. The mill levy is one thing, which is one of the charts that is inside your little pamphlet showing Elk Creek at the bottom of that mill levy chart, but that's only a part of it. It's the valuation of the property that brings you in your tax money. Um, North Fork sits at a mill levy of 12, but that only brings them in $156,000. You're at a mill levy of 4.9, and that brings you in, it's brought in as much as a million three, and in the past decade is low as about $970,000. So while you're lower um, on, on the mill levies, you're asking for a 50% raise when you're already getting significantly more money than the surrounding departments, just based off evaluation. So how do you justify a 50% pay raise? Uh, we justify a, an increase in our funding uh, and the need to replace equipment. We can no longer accept volunteers uh, because we don't have gear for them. We can't afford to buy bunker gear, so we're turning away volunteers. Um, and, you know, everything that, uh, that I've been shown says that we are going to end up paying more money one way or the other. We can either pay a little bit in additional taxes or we can pay a whole lot more in insurance. And if that's the case, then I certainly know where I stand on that, that issue. Uh, and yes, if you have a higher density of population, uh, a mill levy is going to go farther. But I don't know, I don't really know what you're, where you're going with that, what you'd like me to, to address if you have a specific question. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Davis, thank you.